Hello everybody, this is our presentation on why every vector space has a basis. So, to introduce what Zorn's lemma and the axiom of choice is, um, we're going to start with a quote. And um, in seven, 1973, um, a textbook called The Foundations of Set Theory, written by Israeli authors and mathematicians hailed the axiom of choice, which is what we're going to be studying, as probably the most interesting and the most discussed axiom of mathematics, second only to Euclid's axiom of parallels, which was introduced more than 2,000 years ago. Now, this axiom of choice has, proven, has been proven to lead to paradoxical results, and it was initially received because of that with great skepticism. But also, it came with some equivalent statements, um, some of which include the well-ordering property that every non-empty set of positive integers or the set, any set of natural numbers contains a least element, Tychonoff's theorem, which is that the product of compact spaces is compact, this is used in topology, Zorn's lemma, and the statement that every vector space has a basis. Um, the last two statements that I just mentioned will discuss in more detail uh, pretty soon. First, before we talk about why every vector space has a basis, we need to get some preliminary definitions down. First, we have some definitions that we've already gone over in class. Um, so for a partially ordered set, we have an upper bound, which is an element such that every element in a, in a given set is less than or equal to that upper bound. A maximal element, which is that um, if if an element is less than the maximal, less than or equal to the maximal element, no, sorry, sorry, I got that wrong. If the maximal element is less than or equal to any element in the set, then that element must also be equal to the maximal element. Note that this doesn't say that it's like a supremum. It just says that if you can compare them and an element is uh, somehow greater than the maximal, greater than or equal to the maximal element, it's actually equal to the maximal element. And finally, we have a chain, which is a subset of the partially ordered set where every element is ordered. Now we get to talk about the axiom of choice and its equivalent statement called Zorn's Lemma, which we'll use more often in this proof. First, we have the axiom of choice, which, if you can recall, is shows that a choice fun function exists, where if you have a bunch of sets, you can pretty much choose one element from each set to represent that whole set. And we also have Zorn's lemma, which is that if P is a partially ordered set in which every chain has an upper bound, then P also contains the maximal element. Finally, we have the axiom of multiple choice, which is that for every family of sets A, there exists a function f on A such that for every little a and big A, f of little a is a finite non-empty subset of A. You can kind of see how this is similar to the axiom of choice, um, but it's actually, it implies the axiom of choice, but it's not quite as strong. Finally, we need to discuss some, um, some definitions from linear algebra, since we are talking about why every vector space has a basis. And first, we'll start off with a vector space, which is a vector space V over field F is a set closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. And it also satisfies some properties, which are commutativity, associativity of vector addition, the additive identity, an additive inverse for every element, associativity of scalar multiplication, distributivity over scalar and vector sums, and the existence of a scalar multiplicative identity. Now we're almost done. We'll have to go over um, a linear combination, which is um, a set of vectors. So the linear combination of a set of vectors is a sum where it's the sum of scalar multiples of those vectors. The span of a set of vectors is a set of all linear combinations of vectors. 
And linear independence is a set of vectors um, that are a set of vectors that are linear and linearly independent. If the trivial solution is the only solution to the following equation, and that just means that the only coefficient that works as R ones, R two, and so on is zero. Finally, the basis for a set of vectors is a set of linearly independent vectors who spans that set of vectors. All right, take it away, Alex. Yeah, so before we prove, before we explain our proofs, we're going to go over a little bit of a, a <laughs> brief history uh, to give some context to sort of how this all came to be. So in 1935, a German mathematician named Max Zorn, who was born in Krefeld, Germany, uh, he published his first definitive finding that was what we know as today as Zorn's Lemma, but he published it under the name of the Maximum Principle using the axiom, axiom of choice. Uh, he published it in the Bulletin of, of, of the American Mathematical Society, and earlier versions of the theorem that lay a groundwork for his lemma were formulated in 1935 by Claude Chivalli and Emil Martin. Uh, so in his research, Zorn was aiming to sort of find other methods other than using the well-ordering principle that could be used to yield results in field theory. Um, so his paper was titled A Remark on Method in Transfinite Algebra. And yeah, as I explained, it's, 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 its main intention was sort of develop axiomatic studies in field theory um, with his, in relation to his maximum, maximum principle as opposed to using the well-ordering principle. Um, Artin who Zorn studied under as a, uh, as a PhD student, uh, is the one who recognized that Zorn's lemma implies the axiom of choice and then sort of vindicated the equivalence of both. Although in Zorn's paper in 1935, he did the axiom of choice, the well-ordering principle, principle, and Zorn's lemma are all equivalent, although he did not prove the claim in his paper. Um, and then in 1984, later on down the road, Andreas Blas, proved that if a vector space has a basis, then the axiom of choice holds. So since Zorn's lemma and its equivalent, the axiom of choice, were commonly used to prove that every vector space has a basis, Bloss's proof showed that all of, all of them were equivalent. So the axiom of choice, Zorn's lemma, and the statement that every vector space has a basis. So that is our brief history. Um, so now we're going oh, to... Oh, and then... Oh, go ahead. No, 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 you're good, you're good. I was just going to state that, um, uh, yeah, eventually Zorn died in, in 1993 in Indiana because he had been teaching at, at uh, Indiana Bloomington from 46 to 71. All right, now we're going to go to our first proof, which is that Zorn's lemma implies the statement that every vector space has a basis. What we're going to do is show that... Um, we can get a maximal element for our chain and then use Zorn's lemma. Or we're going to show that we can get an upper bound for a chain of sets and use Zorn's lemma as an every Zorn's lemma proof and then use a contradiction to finish a proof. So to start off, let V be a vector space. We're going to choose some non zero vector, and because there's only, and then, um, put that in its own singleton set. Since there's only one element in that set, it's a linearly independent set. And if that singleton spans V, then that is a basis for V. Otherwise, we can choose another non-zero vector that is linearly independent from that first vector and define a new set to be the union of the singleton with the, the vector that we just chose. Now, if that new set spans v, then it's a basis for v. then it's a basis for v as well, and then we can keep going through this, uh, choosing more and more linearly independent vectors to add it to our new sets until uh, it becomes a basis or indefinitely. And the culmination of each iteration gives a collection of sets, so all the sets that we've created whose elements are linearly independent vectors in V. Since each set contains its the previous like iteration of the set, then we know that we have this following 
order of sets under inclusion, where the first is included in the second, which is included in the third, and so on. Now, let's define a set of all those sets that we just talked about. And these are all those sets, remember, are linearly in the sets of linearly independent vectors. We've already showed this to be partially ordered through the previous reasoning that I just gave. And additionally, for any chain of S1s contained in S2s, containing in S3, and so on in this set, every individual element is linearly independent with any other individual element in any other set. Thus, the union of all those SIs um, only contains linearly independent vectors. So, since that union contains every SI, this union must be the upper bound of that chain because it's con it's, it contains only linearly independent vectors, as is the case for the chain, and it contains all the other sets. Thus, we have a chain of sets, we have an upper bound, so by Zorn's lemma, S contains a maxima element, which we're going to call M. So, now we will assume, and quite foolishly I might add, but this is for the sake of contradiction, that M is not a basis for V. What this means is that we can choose another linearly independent vector that's not in M that uh, is linearly independent with every vector in M. So we can define a new set, which is M union with that new vector that we just chose. And moreover, M, our maxim supposed maximal element, would be contained in this new set. This would imply that there's a set of linearly independent vectors of V such that M union, the new vector we just chose, actually contains M, but it doesn't equal M, which contradicts the maximality of M. Therefore, our assumption that M is not a basis must be incorrect, and hence M is a basis for V. So that concludes our proof, and so every vector space has a basis. Now we will discuss the other direction. Okay, so <clears throat> this is where things get a little more interesting and complicated. So we're going to assume that every vector space has a basis and show that it implies the axiom of multiple choice. We're also going to uh, assume the equivalence of the axiom of multiple choice to the axiom of choice and thus Soren's lemma because uh, proving the axiom of multiple choice implies the axiom of choice involves concepts like transfinite induction and ordinal numbers, which uh, are beyond the scope of our presentation and the class. All right, so first we're going to let X uh, be a family of non-empty sets and without loss of generality, assume that the sets in X are pairwise disjoint. Then we're going to join all the elements of X as variables to some arbitrary field, which we'll call K. We can obtain a KX, a field of rational functions of the variables in X. And I should note that there is a slight typo on this slide because uh, K shouldn't be in brackets, but in parentheses because we are dealing with fields. Okay. Uh, for every I and I, we define I degree of a monomial to be the sum of exponents of elements of Xi in the monomial. Now I'll go over more of what I degree is when we come to the homogeneous uh, definition. Next, we're gonna define a function F in field Kx to be the quotient of two polynomials in Kx. Functions like F are those obtained as we've seen uh, by the algebraic fraction of polynomials uh, and are called rational functions. We call a rational function I homogeneous of degree D if every monomial in the denominator has I degree D and every monomial in the numerator has I degree N plus D. And we could easily see this by defining some X1, X2 to be, let's say, X1 equals AB and X2 equals uh, the elements C, D, and we could create uh, 
two polynomials, let's say PQ and KX, uh, and figure out the degree of the rational function by uh, figuring out the degrees of each monomial, which have to be the same because they're homogeneous. The rational functions that are i homogeneous degree zero. Uh, so basically, you figure out the degree of each polynomial in the numerator and the denominator, and uh, by division, you see that the total degree is zero. Uh, so that's what's meant by i homogeneous degree zero for all i and i that make a subfield of kx, which we will call j. Uh, by field extension, uh, Kx is a vector space over J. So to finish the proof, uh, we will now let V be the subspace of K of X that is spanned by set X over J. Um, by our assumption that every vector space has a basic basis, uh, this, the, this subspace is a K vector space. Um, and we'll define its basis as B. Um, and th this is this basis is what we will eventually use to define the finite sets um, that sh uh, demonstrate the axiom of multiple choice. So for every I in I and each X in XI, we can define X to be a finite K linear combination of the elements of B. Um, as per the uh, the equation one listed there, uh, where B X is a finite subset of B, and A subscript B X is a non-zero element in J for every B in B X. Um, so if we define another element Y in the same x i as x, then we get a second equation, uh, equation two, um, which you can see is uh, similar. That, uh, so if we, we multiply equation one by the quotient y over x, we get a second equation for y, um, but this time in terms of x. Um, and if we compare these two, express, two expressions, um, because B is a basis, we can infer that B of X is equal to B of Y. And this means the only term that differs between the two ex expressions is the A sub B term. Um, so, you know, by directly comparing those, you can see uh, A sub B of Y is equal to Y over X times A sub B of X. So the finite subset B of X of B and the elements A sub B of X over X of K of X only depend on I and not on the particular uh, element X of XI that we choose. Um, so in, in order to reflect this dependence only on I, we're going to change the the naming a little bit, we will call B of X uh, B sub I and uh, A sub B of X over X, we will call beta sub BI uh, for the rest of the proof. Um, since A sub B of X is an element of J, which is to say it's I homogeneous of degree zero, and uh, to obtain beta sub BI, we are dividing it by another X term. Um, beta sub BI is I homogeneous of degree negative one. Um, and therefore when it is written out as a quotient of two polynomials in its most reduced form, um, there must be some variables from XI in the denominator. Um, so the, the fact that it has it, its i homogeneous of degree negative one is telling you the uh, xi terms in the denominator are of a higher de degree than those in the numerator. Um, so now we will define fi to be the set of the elements in xi that occur in the denominator of the reduced form of beta sub bi for some b and bi. 
uh, this gives us an FI that is a non-empty finite subset of XI, which is exactly what we need to demonstrate the axiom of multiple choice. Um, so this concludes our proof as we uh, take is known uh, for the sake of the proof that the axiom of multiple choice is equivalent to and implies uh, the axiom of choice, which in turn is equivalent and to and implies Zorn's lemma.